So Professor Brown, can I, I'm gonna call you Dorothy because as people may not know who are watching, we know each other. Uh, yeah. And I've been a long and great admirer of your work. And so thank you so much for taking time out to record this conversation about your extraordinary book. Thank you so much for having me and it's good to see you. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I remembered talking with you about this book and that it was coming and when it came out uh, and still I was unprepared, you know, until I started digging into it, um, you know, for how um, carefully you have kind of laid out the thesis of this book uh, and the case that you've made, right, for the urgency of us uh, talking about this particular issue. There's a lot of conversation about the Black-White wealth gap. There's a lot of conversation about um, the need to address wealth and equities in our society. I have rarely heard those conversations focus on uh, the tax code and what, what the tax code has to do with the Black-White wealth gap and what it has to do with, um, with wealth and equities and the use of it as a tool to address um, some of the past inequities and to close that gap. So I, I would love for you to just give an overview of just kind of the thesis of the book. And you tell a wonderful story at the beginning of the book that um, involves your parents about how you first kind of had a lens <clears throat> into the fact that something was up with the tax code in ways that affected your parents that got your interest in really digging deeper and exploring this. So I wanna start by saying I went into tax law because I too thought it had nothing to do with race. <laughs> I grew up in the South Bronx. I dealt with racism on a regular basis. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, but I wanted to be a lawyer in an area of law that had nothing to do with race. And I, th I said, oh, it's tax law because the only color that matters is green. So I merrily go into tax law, I get an LLM in tax and like a dutiful daughter, I prepare my parents' tax returns. And my mother was a nurse, my father was a plumber for the New York City Housing Authority and I was an investment banker. And by myself, I made what my parents combined made. And the progressive tax system says I pay higher taxes than they do. And I did pay higher taxes than they do, but I didn't pay a lot more taxes than they do, in fact, I always, I did their returns, I did my returns, and I always came away thinking something was wrong. Mm. They were paying too much in taxes, but I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I was doing everything right. Their return was simple. So I wasn't doing anything wrong from a tax law perspective, but there was something that always ate away at me every April 15th. Mm. But I had a job, right? So the next day I'd go to work and I didn't have any time to think about it. It wasn't until I became an academic and I read an article by the late Jerome Culp, who was a mentor of mine mm -hmm. and a Duke Law professor. Yeah. And he wrote an article and in the article it said, how do you know there isn't a race and tax problem if you don't look? And I read it and I said, what, race and tax? And I picked up the phone and I called him and I said, Jerome, I'm going to write about race and tax. And he said, good for you. Well, that was the beginning of the problem because what I discovered was the IRS does not publish statistics by race. How was I ever going to figure out if this question Jerome asked could be answered? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm fairly persistent, determined, <laughs> relentless. And once I had that, you know, bit in my mouth, I wasn't going to let it go. And everything I read about race from that point on, I would put my tax lenses mm -hmm. on to read it. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing I wrote, which was about the tax treatment of marriage, solved the puzzle of my parents' taxes. Well, that's a great place to begin. And, and we, we only have, you know, about an hour, which sounds very luxurious but this is so rich <laughs> that it's gonna fly by because I wanna have an opportunity to talk about three things that I think are illustrative of what you have pulled out of your research. One is marriage, which you just alluded to, which I definitely want you to talk about. The second is home ownership and the tax code. And the third is student loans, uh, just because you know I think a lot of people listening um, may be uh, quite focused on that. Uh, and then I hope we'll have a chance to talk about kind of some of the current policies of the Biden administration, at least as you can discern them and what you think needs to happen. But let's talk about marriage. And I think there is 
maybe it's a mythology or I guess I thought somewhere in the ether that being married is an advantage um, under the tax code. Um, so tell, tell me more about what you learned about who it advantages uh, and under what circumstances it's an advantage. And I'll start by saying the argument I make in the book is that when white and black Americans engage in the same behavior, whether it's getting married, whether it's buying a home, whether it's going to college, tax law subsidizes how white Americans engage mm -hmm. in the behavior and disadvantage how black Americans engage in behavior. Okay, hold gonna... on. Stop, stop. Say that one more time, because I think that's the nugget. Say it one more time. When white and black Americans engage in the same behavior, tax law subsidizes how white Americans engage in the behavior, but disadvantages disadvantage how black Americans yeah. engage in the behavior. Okay, so marriage is a good place to start. And, you know, somebody might be saying, well, how is that possible? And what you need to remember is these laws did not form out of Zeus's head. They came through Congress, typically because of a rich white taxpayer who wanted to pay less in taxes. And marriage is the prime example. We have a joint return, which created by Congress in 1948, because of a rich white couple named Henry and Charlotte Seaborn. In 1927, they were paying higher taxes than they thought they should be paying. And historically, the only people paying taxes in 1927 were the richest Americans. So the Seaborns were one of those couples, and they created their own tax break, where he was the sole wage earner, and he shifted half of his income to his stay-at-home spouse, Charlotte. As a result of that shift, the unit, the husband and wife, paid lower taxes. And we see this today, single wage earner households get a tax cut. So think of a guy who makes $100,000 and he gets married. Well, before he gets married, he, pay tax, he pays taxes at a, a certain marginal tax rate, let's say 25%. If he gets married and his spouse stays at home, that unit is going to pay taxes at a lower marginal tax rate, let's say 12%. So as a result of getting married, single wage earner households get a tax cut. But but black married couples, black house in black households, even dating back to the period when this was created, are rarely the stay at home. One one party stays at home. Black women have worked outside the home forever, right? In this country, is that what the nugget is? That's the nugget. White Americans do marriage differently than Black Americans. It takes two $50,000 workers to get in a household with 100000 so of the, the, the single wage earner. So Black marriages are more likely to have two full-time co-equal wage earners, and they get no tax cut. And for years, their taxes actually went up from had they stayed single. So that's what was happening to your parents. That's what was happening to my parents. Mm -hmm. They were paying higher taxes because they were married to each other. Because and, both working, and both working in a, in a kind working. of similar salary jobs. Yeah, that's right. And when I would do their taxes, I used to marvel at how close their incomes were together. Mm -hmm. Like depending on how much overtime my father made would determine, did he win this year or did my mother win this year? And I would always feel a certain level of pride when my mother earned more <laughs> than my father, not knowing they were both getting disadvantaged because they were earning income so close together. And when I sent my mother the draft marriage chapter, mm -hmm. she said, they owe me and Jane's reparations. And I, <laughs> I never, it. I never heard my mother use the R word in her life. She was not happy. Wow. Wow. So this opens a whole nother channel. So, so there are a couple of things I think were really interesting for me in the, in just reading the text that I realized have been kind of erased from our understanding of taxes in this country. And you, you very quickly said one of them earlier, which is that for a very long time, only the richest American Americans paid taxes. Yes. Um, and so I'd love you to share a little bit more about that. And then before we go on to home ownership, I would love for you to talk about the changes that were made in the tax code 
because of something that we don't often associate again with taxes, which is war, which is war. Yes. Okay. Yes. So first, so first, <clears throat> tell us about who paid taxes in the in the first, let's say, thirty years of uh, the twentieth century. Who was paying taxes and who were not paying taxes? Rich white Americans were paying taxes, and the rest of us were not. And that's how our modern progressive tax system was designed to do back in 1913, when we had our modern income tax system as a result of the 16th Amendment being passed, the only people who paid tax, and it was like, you know, 3%, 5%, most people did not. And what do you mean by progressive tax? That the more you and, make, the more you pay? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. The higher your income, the higher the tax rate that applies to your last dollar of income, right? So mm -hmm. what we have is, an exemption amount, meaning if you made less than that amount, you didn't have to pay any taxes. The exemption amount was so relatively high to the typical American income that most Americans, 90% of Americans didn't pay taxes because they didn't make enough. Mm -hmm. It was only the highest income Americans that paid taxes. Mm -hmm. And that changed as a result of World War II. Mm -hmm. We needed more revenues to fund the war. And as World War II was ramping up, so was our tax system that suddenly now 85%, 90% of Americans were paying taxes. And you can mm. think back in the 1940s, <clears throat> excuse me, and beyond, where we, we start seeing Black Americans, as well as most white Americans, paying taxes, but we were Jim Crow. We had black Americans paying taxes, but they were not able to get access to government benefits fairly. So World War II revolutionized who the taxpayer was. And what's interesting is precisely that point that you just raised, which continues as the tax code then changes after the war, um, uh, you know, and during the Cold War, it's still a war, right? Right. Uh, as you know, and it and it really leads us into the the home ownership piece, right? Because yes. we all know that there is an effort after the war to in ensure that uh, returning GIs can can get education and can own their own homes, and thus the GI Bill. Uh, and we also know <laughs> that um, defense contractors uh, were flourishing during this post-war period still. Um, and again, in the Cold War, and and th those were jobs. Uh, but as yes. you point out in the book, <laughs> this is we have to remind ourselves pre Brown versus Board of Education. So share something about about that. Yes. Yeah, so when we think about home ownership, one of the things that's really talked about is if you sell your home at a gain, and you're married, you can receive half a million dollars of that gain tax free. If you're single, a quarter of a million dollars. That's a huge wealth building provision in our tax laws. It dates to 1951, and it dates to the first exclusion for gain from homes in 1951. Why 1951? Because as Sherilyn just said, <clears throat> we had a defense industry ramping up and they needed workers. We also, in 1950, for the first time, had a majority of white Americans who were homeowners. Why for the first time? Because in the 1940s, the revolution in our mortgage industry of FHA insured, low fixed, long-term interest rates propelled white Americans to now have a majority who are homeowners. Mm. In 1940, <clears throat> only a minority. In 1950, a majority. So now we've got Majority of, of white Americans are homeowners, but these jobs are in another part of the country. And in order to take one of those good paying jobs, they'd have to sell their home and they would pay tax on the gain. So the real estate lobby went to work and helped Congress pass a bill that enabled them to not have to pay taxable gain when they sold their homes. Surprise, surprise, the de defense industry, which is competing for these laborers, they're not competing for black laborers, it's for white laborers. Mm -hmm. It's for white laborers mm -hmm. who are homeowners, the majority of whom are homeowners. So we see this tax provision that was designed with white homeowners in mind. Can you can you follow that thread on, on capital gains? And because there is a difference between selling your home and purchasing a more expensive home as the next home, 
and selling your home and choosing to downsize, right? Like right. many people might wish to do if, after their kids leave or just to get hold of their finances and so forth. So share a little bit about what that and, and what it looks like today. Does that still exist and how, how it affects us? Right. So over time, that tax-free treatment has gotten more and more generous for homeowners. So that today we have this, you can sell your home at up to a half a million dollars is tax-free and you could downsize. That's fine. The prior law required you to basically continue to buy increasingly more expensive homes. But in the late 1990s, it was changed so that, nah, you don't have to, you could downsize. You still won't have any gain when you sell your home. And if by some miracle you sell your home and you're married for more than half a million dollars, then you have gain, but it's taxed at the low preferential rate because your house is considered a capital asset like stock. So that there's this preferential treatment all around for, I would say, how white Americans do home ownership as compared with how black Americans do home ownership. How, how is that? Give me the give me how the racial piece fits into that. And it's really important. So what we start with is white and black Americans live in different neighborhoods and white and black homeowners live in different neighborhoods. White homeowners live in predominantly homogeneous white neighborhoods. Black homeowners, on the other hand, are more likely to live in racially diverse or all black neighborhoods. The most attractive neighborhoods to white homeowners are those homogeneous white neighborhoods. And the law supply and demand tells us that means those houses are going to be priced higher. They're going to have more interest amongst more homeowners. And that means the greatest wealth will be found in neighborhoods with overwhelmingly white neighbors. Now, if you're one of the few black homeowners in that neighborhood, then it will be a good investment for you too. However, if you are one of the few black homeowners in an all white neighborhood, you will have to deal with your neighbors calling the police. You will have to deal with your children being targeted by teachers for engaging in the same behavior that white peers do, but suddenly your child is the discipline problem. You'll, you have a home that's a good financial investment, but you have a whole other set of troubles. On the other hand, if you live where most black homeowners do in racially diverse or all black neighborhoods, the appreciation is not as great. And black homeowners are more likely to sell their home for a loss. And what a surprise, tax law treats losses very badly. In fact, if you sell your home at a loss, you get no tax break. But if you sell your stock at a loss, you get a tax break. So <laughs> subsidies yeah. for home ownership are designed for the typical white homeowner who sells their home at a game. At a game, they're not designed for black homeowners who sell at either less gain or at a loss. Wow. Have you done any calculation or, or thought about how we might calculate what the losses have been for black families just by the, the policies affecting home ownership at all? I bet you haven't because you told me that they don't even keep the data based on race, so it's kind of hard. Exactly, exactly. So there have been um, research that have, have calculated how much less equity black mm -hmm. Americans have because they live in a, a majority black or racially diverse neighborhood. So there have been those calculations, but not how much foregone that, that we've lost in taxes because we've sold our home at a loss. No, the IRS and, and, makes it impossible because they and won't. Of, and of course, we haven't even overlaid this with, you know, FHA policies and redlining and all the other ways that um, the, the federal government af affected and affects uh, and ongoing policies affect the, right. the uh, value of black homes and uh, appreciation and depreciation of black homes, uh, neighborhoods, homes in black neighborhoods and how that also has to interplay into this. Oh, absolutely. So we have the history piece mm -hmm. where GIs coming back couldn't get um, educated, right? Black, black GIs, GIs, right? Black GIs couldn't get uh, VA loans. Black. So we have the federal government actively discriminating against black 
Americans in terms of buying a home. And, and could only buy in certain neighborhoods, right? And could <laughs> only buy in certain neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods were ones that the FHA refused to insure because Black people were there, right? So <laughs> we have the federal government, but the, you know, now, in theory, the, you know, Fair Housing Act of 1968 comes along, so you can't do that anymore. But we have these preferences built in to psyches, to white psyches, for example. And I want to talk about one particular research. Uh, sociologist out of University of Illinois, Chicago, Maria Kreisen, has done these video studies. So I always get pushback. Well, Dorothy, it's not about race, it's about crime. Because people don't realize you just said all Black people are criminals. Okay, that's <laughs> racist, but I digress, right? It's not because I don't want to live next to you because you're Black, it's because you're a criminal. Okay, but you're conflating those two. So she's created videos, three different videos, same identical neighborhood. The only thing that changed was the race of the actors walking through the neighborhood. Video one, all the actors were white. Video two, 60% of the actors were white, 40% were black. Video three, 100% of the actors were black. And, and, she, and, they're, and they're walking through like their residents or like they're just the foot Yes, traffic like their residents. Some Got people it. are walking, some people act like they're fixing cars, mm -hmm. other people, right? So they're just walking through like they okay. live here. Okay. And they and she asked, which neighborhood would you like to live in? And the white viewers picked the all white neighborhood and the black viewers picked the racially diverse or all black neighborhood. And a distant, distant third was the all white neighborhood. There's no crime. There's identical social amenities. There's nothing that changed except the mm. race of the actor. So research shows that even though white Americans would like to think it has nothing to do with race, it really is about race. Well, and also, you know, I, I go back to the role of the federal government again. Um, you know, sure, we have the Fair Housing Act, and 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 of course, we know that, um, you know, much of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, intention has not really been realized. And, right. you know, we, we remain ever hopeful um, on affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, but, you know, neighborhoods became fixed because of those policies. Yes. So the ongoing effects of those policies are real and, and potentially calculable, um, but yes, they're definitely absolutely. real because that they fixed, you know, you, I tell people all the time, you, you know, part, it's all in the landscape. You know, you may think that you're just living in this community because that's where black people live. I live on the west side of Baltimore. I live on the east side of Baltimore. But um, you know, many of these neighborhoods were fixed by those policies and they and those policies continue to have an effect on uh the the value of black homes and therefore the the you know ability of black people to to gather wealth. So I want to hit one more thing and then I want to pull it all together. And that's just talking about student loans. Um, and in particular, there's this, there's a, there's, it's so brief, it's so brief in the book, but like it blew my mind where you said very casually, and if you do have student loans, um, student loan debt, and you want to get married, you know, get married in January and not December. Okay. So like, just first of all, tell us about student loans and then what? <laughs> Explain. Yes. This is, this is real information people need. So listen That's up. That's right. Youngins. <laughs> okay. So first of all, you know, student debt, black college students are more likely to leave with debt than their white peers. And they're more likely to have their debt increase over time while white debt decreases over time. So when we think of debt, we think of paying off debt and debt decreasing over time. Well, for black college students, debt increases over time. It's often a function of there being an income-based repayment programs because their income isn't high enough to amortize the full amount of the debt. And because black students are more likely to go to grad school and take out more debt there. What, and black students are more likely to self-fund with debt. White Americans have grandparents and parents who can pay for college. Black students often don't. So we have to finance by debt. And the tax well, let me rate. let me wait. Let me stop you there because I'm sure that there are white people listening, uh, or who will say, "No, I I also have student loans, or yeah. I'm you know my family was working class, or my family's middle class, but certainly the cost of higher education is so exorbitant that only really the wealthy could afford 
um, to, to fully you know, cover it themselves. So aren't a lot of white students also yeah. experiencing what you described? No, because white students who have debt, their debt is amortizing over time. They're able to find jobs that can pay their debt off. Whereas so black it intersects students, with with, uh, with the labor market, is, yeah, with disparities in the labor market. Okay, and and it intersects with who graduates. Mm. While sixty percent of white students who start college graduate, only forty percent of black students who start college graduate. And if you don't graduate, you don't have access to that better paying job that can amortize and pay mm -hmm. off that debt. So the white college experience is very different than the black college experience. And the tax break, which is up to $2,500 of interest paid on your student debt is deductible, assuming you don't make too much money. The problem is it's $2,500 whether you're single or married. So if two single debt student debt holders get can take $2,500 on their individual tax return. When they get married as a unit, they can only take $2,500. Wow. That's why I say don't, don't do it on December 31st. Do it on January 1st. So wow. you delay that hit one more year. But you're going to get the hit. You're going to get the hit. You could just delay it a year. Because as wow. one of my students, one of my students said, Professor Brown, are you saying we shouldn't get married? I said, don't tell your <laughs> grandmama that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Necessarily. <laughs> Necessarily. <laughs> exactly. Do not go right. home and tell your relatives. Brother Brown said I should get married. No, no, no. Let's just delay it a year. <laughs> so so what are we so what are we to do? So here we are, and you've uncovered and helped us see another room, right? You know, we, yes. we constantly open up these chambers for us to understand how deeply race and racism has um and, and policies that appear to be race neutral, right? Yes. Are the drivers of wealth inequity and income disparities uh, in, in this country without question. And so now we have the tax code laid before us and you're taking it back to 1927 to changes that were made and the changes that, you know, that are made that advantage largely white people. Right. Let's bring this all the way up to the present because we just had a major tax cut uh, just a few years ago. Yes. Um, and so this is real for us. And as we have talked about the, the tax cut, we've talked about the tax cut for the wealthy and the way it has benefited the wealthy. We talked about it increasing the def deficit and we hear those conversations now. Um, this was Trump's tax cut, but I actually have not heard a lot of commentary, particularly in the media space about the racial implications of the tax cut. And this goes back really to where we began, which is that when we hear discourse about taxes and the tax code, it almost is never in, um, in, in discussion presented to us in ways that demonstrate or reflect what the racial impact of the tax code is. So share a little bit about um, what could have been the conversation in 2017 with the Trump tax cut. And it's, you know, it's annoying to me as someone who has studied this for 25 years. And so, so it's annoying to me how little conversation we have around race and tax. And I just wanna highlight, for example, the ProPublica series on the wealthy, all of whom are white, all of whom, let me repeat, all of them are white and not once do they mention race, not once. The story where it was the most obvious to me was when they talked about the tax rate, the low tax rate paid, paid by sports owners versus the higher tax rate paid by the players. They had pictures, all the owners were white, most of the players were black and not once did they talk about race as a, as a mechanism to building wealth. So the 2017 tax, cuts would have been a conversation around rich white Americans getting a tax break and black Americans not getting a tax break. Mm -hmm. that, that would have been the conversation that it wasn't just, you know, the high income, it was high income white Americans. For example, let's take the marriage penalty, the, the penalty my parents paid because they were married. The Trump tax cuts minimize significantly the marriage penalty. 
At which point somebody says, Dorothy, are you saying Trump was for blacks? No, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is over time, more and more white couples were paying the marriage penalty like my parents. Mm. And suddenly their pain was recognized and we had the marriage penalty eliminated temporarily for certain households. Mm -hmm. But what was left out were high income households and the earned income tax credit households. Mm. So we have a tax break that would disproportionately benefit married white couples. Because when you look at high income married black couples, they're more likely to still be in 50-50 households paying the marriage penalty than Mm -hmm. their white peers. Mm -hmm. So even a tax reform that, uh, that helped Ma- the marriage penalty in Black Americans in that zone didn't help a disproportionate percentage of Black Americans in other households. So it, you, it, you can, I just need just to, to make you pause on the earned income tax credit families and what does that have to do with it? Because you, uh, you talk about it in the book and you just said it, but um, people yes. listening may not know. So earn, the earned income tax credit is available to workers, low-income workers, and it is a subsidy on top of the income that they receive. So if you are in an earning of tax credit eligible household and you're eligible for a tax refund, it may be greater than the taxes you pay into the system. So you wind up getting a check from, from the federal government. The earning of tax credit was designed to offset withholding and social security taxes from low income workers. There are significant marriage penalties in earned income tax credit house, uh, the, the calculation of the earned income tax credit. And the 2017 act did nothing to ameliorate that. So the same families subject to an earned income tax credit marriage penalty pre 2017 are still paying the marriage penalty post 2017. So let's pull it all together. Um, because you, you've given us the bad news <laughs> and yes. the sobering news and the problem. And of course, we can't solve a problem unless we can see it. And so the genius of this book is really helping us see something that was behind the veil. Let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing right now in the approach, let's say, of the Biden administration to tax policy. And it's early days yet. Yes. Um, but but if, if you were advising the president on what should happen around tax policy, what's the kind of conversation you would want to have with the president? Uh, what, what do you see them doing that you think uh, is either counterproductive or not solving the problem? Or do you see them doing things that you think are a good first step to beginning to address some of the issues that you talk about in the book? So I'm seeing both. So the first thing I would advise the president is to make Treasury live up to his racial equity order which is something he signed, the, the, his first- The president. Mm-hmm. The president. The mm-hmm. president signed his first executive order that included basically a charge to all yes. of his federal agencies to disaggregate data by race. Mm-hmm. We've seen nothing on race and tax out of Treasury. We've seen nothing mm-hmm. on race and tax mm-hmm. out of the IRS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So step one, he, I would say, Mr. President, please let the Treasury Secretary and the commission of the IRS know you meant what you wrote and Excellent. hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. Okay? okay, so that's, that works. That's, mm-hmm. Right, that's Got step it. one. <laughs> step two, when you talk about tax policy, actually talk about race. They never talk about race. They talk about, w- which allows the public to think those two things are divorced yes, and to continue yes. the myth of the colorblind tax code. So <sighs> that's that's the second thing. Now, they are doing some good things. So one of the great things in the Build Back Better Mm -hmm. um, uh, tax plan is a permanent expansion of the child tax credit to all earned income tax credit. Let's just talk about the, the child tax credit for a minute, because this is one policy that I think is potentially game changing and somehow seems not to have been um, afforded, I mean, this is a huge uh, moment, I think, uh, in terms of families that are lifted out of poverty and the kind of relief that that it's provided. And somehow in the media, it doesn't seem to have kind of, and maybe even in our communities, gotten the traction. I mean, people are getting the checks, but the policy itself hasn't gotten the traction as a specific policy 
that puts additional money in the hands of working class people with children and particularly benefits black families. Right, so what's so fascinating to me is the expanded child tax credit to earn income tax credit household is a reversal of what happened in 1997. In 1997, when the child tax credit was created, it expressly excluded low income earn income tax credit families because Republicans called it welfare and the Dems didn't push back. So the poorest among us. Well, this was part of this was part of Clinton's mend it, don't yes, end it or something. No, that yes. was affirmative action. I couldn't remember. Okay, <laughs> exactly. But it was the same. It was welfare reform, ending That's welfare it. reform That's as it. we know it, right? Yeah. So, and I've written about this. So I'm watching in real time it getting reversed. Mm -hmm. And I started hearing Senator Manchin talk about entitlement, entitlement. Mm -hmm. and work requirement, right? Yes. And I said, here we go. Yeah, the yeah. welfare mm -hmm. language is starting to creep back in. So mm -hmm. what we have is the a permanent expansion of the child tax credit to earn income tax credit families, but a one year extension of the higher amounts of the child tax credit, right? So for the next year, we will continue to see fewer children going to bed hungry, which is an mm -hmm. amazing thing, right? But they haven't, they haven't really, like you said, championed it the way they could have. So, you know, I've seen that, which is great. I've also seen other things, which is not so great. So there's this thing in tax law that allows wealthy individuals to inherit property and not pay any taxes on it. And it's not mm -hmm. the estate tax. It's called the it's called the stepped up basis. Let me give you an example. Aunt Ethel buys property for $10,000 and she dies and it's worth $100,000. Aunt Ethel's niece, um, Harriet, inherits that property. Harriet gets a basis of $100,000 and Harriet sells it tomorrow for $100,000 and she's sitting there with $100,000. The tax law says she has no gain because of this thing called step up in basis. You give her a basis equal to the value when her aunt died. That was in a proposal of the Dems, but it got removed because of the pushback and the Dems never really fought for it. So it, it wound up not being in there. So, so there a, ch are, a change, a change, to a the change. Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. That would have prevented the richest Americans from inheriting that tax free, but it wasn't in there. So, you know, I don't see a full throated defense, a full throated argument for racial equity in our tax laws, because for some reason, people are afraid to talk about it. Now, I've also testified before the Senate Finance Committee about racial equity in the tax code as a result of the book being published. Mm -hmm. so, so there are some people who are willing to have this conversation. I'm just not seeing enough, of, nearly enough of it. You know, what's interesting about it and the reason why I, I talk about, you know, and ask the question about kind of, you know, why why some of these things take traction and some seem not to kind of get public traction, you know, is because of what you just described, which is the narrative around low income people and welfare and entitlements, the idea that low income people are getting something for nothing and that people who make the most are job creators are somehow um, you know, almost a, an oppressed class of people who just right. are compelled to use right. their money to keep the country going and so forth. And there really isn't, um, sometimes you hear people talk about tax loopholes as a form of welfare and so forth, but because people don't understand the dynamics of it in the way that you're describing it in this book and the way you described it for us today, it's hard for people to get their hands around. And I just wondered um, if, you know, you're such an, a brilliant communicator and you and I talk about communications quite a bit, what do you think is the way we ought to be talking about it, you know, at LDF or other organizations that are addressing issues of wealth inequality and want to fold this in to the work that that uh, we're trying to do? So I think the entitlement mentality is a good narrative for the wealthy who mm. think they're entitled to pay no taxes. <laughs> Right. So so we can talk about entitlement, but we need to make it a fair fight. OK, yeah. 
Yeah. The minute the billionaire's tax proposal came out, and by the way, I love Senator Wyden for that. The, the minute the billionaire's tax came out, Elon Musk basically pushed back because he thinks he's entitled to paying no taxes. So even, even though he has to be getting and has received subsidies for space and, and wants actually, right, to, to yes. receive subsidies for his space And adventures. I believe there was an article that talked about the billionaires that got PPP loans. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, so, yes. you know, there is an entitlement mindset, but it's not with the poorest of Americans who work really hard to better themselves. It's with the richest Americans. So mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. and I also think civil rights organizations shouldn't be afraid to enter the tax fray. So part of why I'm so excited to talk with you today is I'm reaching people I wouldn't generally mm -hmm. reach, mm -hmm. and I want them to not think tax is different. Tax is as Jim Crow as mass incarceration, but we don't think about it like that. So what this conversation will do hopefully is get people thinking about, you can't talk about systemic racism and not talk about tax law. Well, now you've got me curious, is, is, is there any aspect of, I know what you teach, but across the country, lawyers are being taught tax law or law students are being taught tax, tax law. Have you had a sense or had a chance to, to engage with your colleagues, your white colleagues, around how they teach tax yes. uh, and whether this is part of, of the curriculum. I mean, I, I did a whole crusade in my years of teaching of kind of teaching civil procedures sit through the lens right. of race and civil rights. Um, t tell me something about that, because that seems like a good place to start at least changing the kind of underpinning and understanding of so uh, the relationship between race and tax. And I think it was the summer of 2020. So the summer of 2020, we all know George Floyd was murdered and some white people for the first time thought I need to do something. Well, one of the things they did was the Association of American Law Schools had an online session on basically race and tax. And I spoke at it and some other people spoke at it. And I basically told people how they could incorporate these ideas into their classroom. And I also recommended the federal income tax case book I'm a co-author on that has race, <laughs> class, gender, sexual orientation, and all these other mm, issues mm. in it. So there's certainly a movement afoot for more tax professors to engage in this material in the classroom than ever before, but there still isn't enough. But the group that really needs to be educated are the reporters who cover tax. Mm. The mm. reporters who cover tax are by and large white males and they don't know race. They don't understand racism. They sure don't understand systemic racism, and they think tax has everything to do with class and nothing to do with race. So that's the, the conversation mm. that also mm. needs, to, needs to occur. There are some reporters who talk to me, but lots of reporters who talk about tax have say nothing about race. I go back to the ProPublica series, like yeah, what, yeah. what the what? And so, that's, a progressive, that's a progressive publication. Mm -hmm. Ding, ding, ding. That's exactly right. You can be progressive and not good on race. <laughs> so here we have it. So, so I think more people need, in the civil rights community need to grapple with taxes and grapple with how their communities are being disadvantaged because it's not as complicated as you think. Now, Sherilyn, you've read the book. You're an honest sort. Was it that complicated to get through? Well, I will say this, <laughs> that I had to read some, some sections over, not because it was complicated, but because, you know, I really have not at all, <laughs> frankly, really thought about this subject. And I wanted to make sure what I was reading was correct and that I was understanding it. I mean, I found it actually a very um, moving, you know, engaging read because you, you tell all these stories and you use examples of real people so that right. we can, just as you did in this conversation. And so in that sense, it's very reader friendly. But I did feel like I had to kind of say, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, like, what did this just say that? <laughs> 
I know, but it's it's not that complicated. People yeah. want you to think it's complicated, so you leave it to those people, to other people, yes, yes, right? Yes. It's not anything for black people. Mm, my classic mm, example, mm. I presented my marriage penalty bonus work at a law school professor conference, and the first comment was from a progressive white male law professor who said, Dorothy, Everybody knows your work is irrelevant because blacks are poor and don't pay a lot in taxes. Woo. Okay, wow. that's that's the mindset. Black people are poor. We don't pay a lot in taxes. Well, first of all, the poor pay a lot in taxes. The poor low-income workers were discriminated against when it came to their children and the child tax credit before this recent expansion. So First, that's a lie that poor don't pay a lot of taxes, but more importantly, the majority of black Americans aren't living in poverty. Mm. So let's talk about the 77%. Let's talk about what tax law is doing to them. So it's this mindset that we've kind of left taxes to progressives and conservatives, which so is know, not looking out for us. My mind is going a mile because you know I'm a I'm a I'm an action item person. So my mind is going it. a mile a minute about how we could break pieces of this yes. and infiltrate it into our communities, right? Yes. So I'm yes. thinking about churches. I'm thinking about yes. all these places where people are counseled yes. uh, as part of marriage, right? To get married right. in a particular church, and you have to be. Do ministers even know this? Do they? Do they? You know that shouldn't you also be counseled on the tax implications of getting yes. married, right? Yes. What yes. we should be doing for students. I mean, I think about we have uh, a set of scholars, our Marshall and Motley yes. scholars, these fantastic young law students who are going to be civil rights lawyers in the South. Um, and I definitely want to set up at our next retreat um, an opportunity for you to kind of have this, do this presentation with them, and for Absolutely. us to do this conversation. Because I do think that beginning, as you say, to have our community uh, right. understand this as a as a civil rights issue and feel more comfortable with it and not that this is something so off the table um, is really, really important and helpful. And we also run a civil rights institute um, at LDF every year. It's a kind of a private uh, uh, conference really for civil rights lawyers. And um, I think this also would be an, a great opportunity to kind of awaken our senses across uh, the country about right. the, the importance of this. So you talked about this this convening last year by the AALS, um, a kind of online course, you know, about how to in, integrate this into uh, uh, the course for tax professors, and we should, we could probably find a link to that somewhere and include it. Um, but it, it makes me remember that this book came out in the midst of COVID nineteen, which you obviously could not have anticipated. Um, and I'm wondering how the economic effects of uh, COVID-19 um, have in any way either changed or made more urgent your thinking about um, some of the issues that you that you lay out in the book. So I'd say it made it more urgent. I mean, what we saw with COVID-19 is the different treatment between essential workers who could work at home and couldn't mm -hmm. work at home and mm -hmm. the race of who could who had to go mm -hmm. outside, yes. who had to risk yes. their health. Yes. So, so, you know, and, and the impact that that will have on the racial wealth gap in years to come, right? Mm -hmm. So so the tax subsidies for work um, are even more important now because if you have a full-time job, you get access to these tax-free benefits. But if you're in the gig economy, if you're mm -hmm. trying to make ends work, mm -hmm. you don't have access to those tax-free benefits like retirement accounts or health insurance. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, COVID-19 made racial disparities worse. Mm. If there's a single thing, a single policy that we as a civil rights community could push for um, that you think would would be, it's not, it's not necessarily all you want, but would be potentially the most transformative in the tax space, what would that be? So I'm going to say two things. One, <laughs> race cheating. and tax data. Race and tax data. 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 Okay. okay. Got it. So I if I that. had, okay. The second thing might be treating income from labor the same as income from stock. Hmm. That right now you have a low preferential rate if you sell stock, but your wages are taxed at the highest marginal tax rate. Mm -hmm. And we know who has access to capital 
And we, we just know, saw we just saw Elon Musk sell a whole bunch of stock the other just day. Just saying, right? Yes. right? Mm -hmm. We know who owns capital in that way, and we know who has labor, right? One so so I think the tax distinction between capital and labor mm. would mm. be a game changer. Wow, wow, wow. Dorothy, this has been so terrific. The book is wonderful. I have it right here. People should get it. It's called The Whiteness of Wealth, How the Tax System Impoverishes Black Americans and How We Can Fix It. Probably can't see it because it's a white cover, um, but it is such an, such an engaging read. It's so important and it really opens a portal. Um, and many of us who have been at this work, at civil rights work for decades have not really had our eyes open to the importance of this issue. I'm so grateful to you for this contribution. Um, this is precisely what we try to do at the Thurgood Marshall Institute at LDF, which is sponsoring this conversation, is try to deepen our knowledge about areas of the work that we don't know as much about and provide an opportunity for our community to learn uh, the depth of the ways in which uh, race affects our lives. And this is a perfect example. Um, I'm looking forward to a documentary. I'm seeing a high school curriculum. I'm seeing uh, sessions at Congress, not testimony, but sessions where you have an opportunity to educate. I'm seeing the infiltration in our community in all kinds of ways. This has legs. This is exciting. Terrific, terrific. And um, thank you so much, Dorothy. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we sign off? No, I'm just delighted to have this conversation and to get this word out in the civil rights activist community. I cannot thank you enough, Sherilyn. Thank you so much.